And so everything will have something to do with uh, fluids. Um, so we can take a few minutes just to look at some interesting uh, eye candy of, of what we're kind of talking about today. Don't have to be quiet, by the way. It's not class time yet. I'll tell you when we get going at 8. So fluids, okay, boat floating, buoyancy, Archimedes principle, fluid mechanics. Um, a glacier flowing down a valley or an ice sheet slowly, a viscous fluid as well. Uh, and apparently, as you'll see in a moment, also a brittle fluid, a brittle solid <laughs> in its frozen form um, as it goes. So don't get too close. Looks pretty nice. Well, there we go. Oh. The other thing you can do when you watch the YouTube videos, if you watch them, you can watch them at double speed. So it's going too slowly for you. <laughs> so waves, we'll talk about waves, uh, not today, but tomorrow, um, uh, Friday, the next class. So anyway. A bit of fun. What else have we got? Um, yeah, well, this is, we were talking about Hunga Tonga the other day. And I'll put, Rob? These are closed captioned. So this was in some other eruption, I guess, uh, in the South Pacific. Uh, and uh, the sea is covered with pumice, right? Pumice is lava, which has gas bubbles in it, which expand. They make closed pores, and so it floats. It's a safe, uh, I don't know if people still use it. It used to be, when I was a kid, you used to use it to scrub the dead skin off your feet because it was kind of mildly abrasive. But it will float in water. It's less dense than water. And so again, Archimedes' principle uh, at stake. That's enough of that. Don't need more. What else? Ah, disaster, yeah. Some of your mining engineers, maybe? It's six maybe? months since the unthink... This is this big tailings dam uh, disaster in Brazil that perhaps killed 300 people, unfortunately, living downstream of dams. That's why dams are dangerous. The, uh, these are tailings. So the tailings are the excess, the waste from mining after you've milled the ore out. Probably an iron ore mine, judging by the red um, coloring of the, the soil. So the waste is just put behind a dam that's actually made of the waste material itself. And then it's infilled progressively, so there's not necessarily any water behind the dam, but it's just a bunch of slurry, very high water content uh, solids that if you trigger it with an earthquake or if it somehow gets struck, it will liquefy. And this is the result of that, just uh, a solid that ultimately became very quickly a fluid. And unfortunately, is a Rio Tinto mine, I think, uh, ultimately became a problem. What else? Oh, yeah, this is interesting to watch as well. I don't know whether this is a spoof or not. You tell me. We talked last time about um, how do you know where, why the Poseidon Adventure liner is a model or not. <clears throat> uh, I'm not, so I can't work this one out. You can tell me whether you think this is a, a spoof or a, a chat GPT. Gen uh, it came before chat GPT because this is older than that. Um, but you'll see. Guy in free fall, you notice the guy in green doesn't have a parachute on. And uh, so that's the kind of the essence of this. Uh, the others do, the, the guy's in black. And so uh, if we fast forward somewhere over the desert, a bit of in going down, down, still no parachute. Still no parachute. I guess that's his personal camera on his, his GoPro on himself. He's, oh, he's very agile, flipping on his back and on his front. And so the other guys drop out of the picture. They pull out their shoots. But not our guy here. Don't worry, it's not a nasty ending, by the way. <laughs> and so that's his camera, apparently, if it's, if it's uh, bona fide. I guess, Luke, I guess I see the title. Luke Atkins, no parachute, 25,000 feet. Oh, interesting.
Real? Unreal? What do you think? Stupid. <laughs> or perhaps brave, I don't know. Not sure. Anyway, yeah, I think that's quite amazing. So obviously, uh, like anything, you don't want to stop quickly with the ground. You want to stop slowly in something that has a bit of give in it, and that's the, uh, the net that he ultimately goes in. It goes in backwards, I guess, uh, so as well. It just flips over at the last moment. So, yeah, interesting, I thought. What else? I think there's one other perhaps I have to get going. Again, fluid mechanics, right? Guy gets to terminal velocity. Terminal velocity is determined by acceleration due to gravity from your dynamics class, F equals MA, and the force acting against you, which is drag on your body, uh, which you can calculate in this class. We'll get to calculate it. No, this isn't very interesting, but uh, it's just, uh, again, two water spouts in the same place, little overwater tornadoes that suck up uh, water. Just the same as tornadoes that you'd have here. I guess uh, we've had tornadoes in State College. We had one maybe a couple of miles from where I live in Bowlesburg, but not for a little while. So that's that. All right. So that's the eye candy for today. Any questions from last time that we didn't take care of? Nope. All right. Well, we'll have to do some work then. What, what it's, uh, this is, these are my crib sheets for myself for the, for the day. Um, so from last time, 1.1 uh, is online. So if you want to uh, see what we did on any day, uh, I guess i not refreshed it. This is the video from last time on YouTube. So recorded and uploaded. So you'll recognize some of this stuff maybe from last time. Uh, I was saying yesterday, uh, this morning to those who might have been here early, I noticed that last time, this year, exactly one year ago, apparently I only have one shirt, which I'm wearing today also. So the stuff's online, if you want that. Uh, you should have by now done the three things, that, well, two of the three things that I asked you to do. Uh, there's no ma mandate. I could, could ask you if you've done them. I won't waste my time. But you should download the homework questions, uh, 7E homework questions. You should download all the exams. And you should also uh, try the exam 1.1 from last year, just to familiarize yourself. I guess that last one isn't necessary to do right now, but it's good to get those things. Also, you should also remember that the one arbiter of how well you do in this class, the uh, possibility for ex success or for excellence, as someone said, how do you excel in this class, someone asked me at the end of class last time, uh, is to be familiar with the, the test, right? The 70% of the grade is on, on those tests. So figure out how to, to do that. Prerequisites, I talked about last time. I haven't had anyone requesting overrides for prerequisites. Um, the syllabus you have online, um, Garrett Ziegler, who I mentioned, was sitting here last year. I don't think he's having uh, office hours this week because he's doing something else for me, getting some of the quizzes in order. But when uh, the homeworks become live on Friday, uh, when we've covered the material to, for you to do them, then he'll hold office hours in the, in the following week. And actually, yeah, I guess Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The Friday is not very good because the homework's already due, and no one goes on the first day of homework. But, but I guess you can ask questions uh, outside the homework. And I guess uh, the other thing that traditionally I do on this, uh, in this class is look at, we talked about presentations. Um, and so uh, turn the video off. This is one of those. Some of them are online. Uh, it should be an intriguing uh, fluid mechanics question. This is called Kelvin Helmholtz instability. It's a dense fluid sitting over a, a, a less dense fluid. So it's kind of the, the, um, the salad uh, dressing thing. You always get the oil sitting on top of the water, not usually the other way around. But if you do it very carefully, you can get a dense fluid to over sit over um, a less dense fluid. And then if you put a gradient on this, you get these regular waves, which actually are quite beautiful. Um, and so this is the, their presentation, a bit of a movie to start off, and then um, some explanation of what's going on. And so there's a whole bunch of these that are available. And so I look this, I put the best ones on, or which I thought was the best ones. I think it's good to use movies. You know, I, I mentioned the, about the Poseidon Adventure last time. This is about ocean currents. Uh, some, of course, use movies for 
four of the five minutes that you're supposed to use it, which is kind of perhaps not uh, fully what you're uh, expected to do. But this is talking about ocean circulation. Um, don't know what these are. Don't know. This must be talking about getting sucked onto railway lines if you're standing too close to the edge, I think. Looks like it illustrated talking about uh, using Bernoulli equation to be able to figure that out and a bit of, bit of math to be able to cement that idea. So it doesn't have to be super complicated. I think the best ones are the ones that are simple and intriguing. So it's not so amazing to talk about why you spin a, a football when you throw it or why there's rifling in a gun barrel. Uh, which is an innate fluid mechanics problem because lots of people know that. But choosing something that's a bit out of the ordinary and creative, uh, I think, is much, much nicer. So you s uh, one was about planes, I think. No, it's the same one. Don't know why that got put into two years. It wasn't double submitted, I don't think. Yeah, there's one on fluid dynamics, on how planes fly, etc doing an in-detail subject. And they, they've got narration. So the best way to make these, so sometime uh, in the semester, three weeks in, I think, I'll put you in groups. Three weeks because some will come to the class and some will leave the class before then. I guess we'll have to drop ad then. And then in those groups of five, there's a schedule for you to get together and pick a topic. And then when you make the presentation to be handed in on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, you just need to, you can do it individually. You just need to decide what you do. If each of the five members of the group make a single PowerPoint slide and narrate it, record the narration in the PowerPoint slide, you can combine them in a deck and then you can just MP3 convert it. So you should be more skillful about that than I am. It's very easy. And I think uh, maybe on the web page, do I have a tutorial for that? Yeah, there's a tutorial on how to do it. So anyway, so that's that. So presentation examples. Any questions now? Just too exciting for you? <laughs> All right, then. Well, let's get rolling. Um, so my proclivity to do this is to use the stuff uh, in this uh, download on the website. So I guess I could show it to you. Right? You know where it is. It is uh, this course notes. So download that. And so I scribble on this. So what we'll talk about today, is it already? No, it's after these. We'll talk about some examples. Don't want to give you whiplash. There's some kind of pace notes here. These are the things we'll talk about today. But first, I'll also give you some kind of reason to live today. And that is to talk about why we're interested in, in fluid mechanics. And I compiled this a few years ago just to kind of chat gen generically about it. And so fluid mechanics in natural systems. The tsunami is an earthquake underwater, offsets, so you get a cliff in the seabed. The cliff in the seabed tries to establish itself as a cliff in the water above it. Water can't hold itself up vertically unless it's frozen. And so you get this wall of water trying to level itself out, and that's a wave that transits across oceans. And we talked about the velocities at which those go, and we'll do that on Friday, talk about that in more detail. Uh, hurricanes, of course, we'll be in hurricanes. We are in hurricane season. Apparently, yesterday was the peak of the hurricane season, and hurricanes are just uh, circulation patterns of uh, driven by energy taken from the sea by convection, uh, spun by the the spin of the Earth and uh, drag uh, unequal as you go up in the latitudes. There's more drag at the equator because it's traveling faster than further up north, and so Coriolis force drags that, and you get this spin. In the uh, beneath our feet, the crust is perhaps 70 kilometers deep and sitting on a, a, a mantle of molten uh, rock, and that convects. And it's that convection that drives plate tectonics by dragging the slab down as it convects and replenishing Iceland as it comes up at the mid-Atlantic mid ridge or at uh, constructive plate boundaries with a, with a, a metal core. Tsunami, uh, the BP uh, horizon disaster, 2010 was it? You'd have been eight or so. Um, and uh, tracking of the pollution that came from that. Ice sheets that sit on top of Greenland in this case is a slow flowing fluid that has a very high viscosity, but nonetheless is a, is a fluid. And Mount St. Helens, May the 18th, 20, 1980. Uh, 
Mount St. Helens in the Cascades in Washington, the, the side of it blew off after deforming for, for many, many uh, months, and uh, air travel was canceled. It was a big disaster in Washington. Maybe 60 people died, not, not a huge. It was well evacuated before that. So natural systems. And that's, of course, driven by magma upwelling from below. Fluid mechanics and engineered systems. Well, if you ever take a plane, I was thinking when I was coming in here, if you go to airports, I was just traveling at the weekend, and if you fly, do you ever talk to anybody if you fly, person next to you? Just, yeah, not just bury your face in your device. I, I sat next to people. My trip from Beijing was 48 hours, and I don't think I talked to a single person <laughs> next to me. And so you just get buried in your device and do whatever, work on your computer. But airfoils uh, give lift. Uh, you probably know from high school physics, the uh, principle of that. The horizon, BP Horizon disaster, drilling not sealing well enough at the seabed so that gas came up the drill stem and uh, caused an explosion on the rig and uh, broke off the drill string at the seabed and cost I don't know, BP $10 billion in fines for not doing it properly. Interesting thing about um, airplanes is that despite GPS, anytime you get on, if you fly out of uh, University Park and you walk up the, the ramp and see the, the front of the plane, you'll see a pitot tube. Pitot tube is just an open tube that kills the velocity of the air against it as you fly through it. And you can measure from the, from the pressure change that you get relative to the atmospheric pressure around you exactly the velocity of the plane using Bernoulli. And still on all planes now. Uh, in fact, there's a big disaster. The Air France flight from um, Paris, no, from uh, Rio de Janeiro to Paris, uh, this actually froze over. And so it couldn't work. And all the electronics on the plane got confused because it wasn't getting a true reading of the, uh, the velocity and went up and down and ultimately uh, flew into the Atlantic off the coast of Brazil. Energy engineers, uh, single vertical uh, uh, wind turbine, articulated wave motion where the articulation from waves uh, running underneath it is the mechanism by which you generate electricity. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge, you must have seen it in physics classes. Resonance from a steady, not very fast wind, but steady velocity wind blowing over the deck, which causes what's called a, a von Karman vortex sheet, which means that a little vortex gets shed from the top of the, the bridge deck and then the bottom of the bridge deck alternately. And so those two, those, those impulses give it some kind of uh, motion, which if it fits with the resonance, like a guitar string, has a, a, a note. If it fits with the resonance frequency of the bridge, it just uh, works the bridge until it falls apart. You see dampers sometimes on utility lines to stop them flapping in the wind. It changes the resonant frequency of the thing. Uh, contaminant hydrology, fluid flow in the subsurface. Rutgers Nice, the big Superfund site here next to the mall um, with lots of strange things in the ground, which in the days of the past. They used to dispose of contaminants just by spraying it into a spray field for it to seep into the ground. Not very smart, we realize now, but uh, in the 1950s, not stupid, or not too stupid as in. Deep geothermal, the answer to our carbon, uh, high carbon lifestyle to reduce, to decarbonize. Gas shale, hydraulic fracturing, flow in pipes uh, to get the fluid, to get the fracking fluid in and to get the gas out. Fugitive gases may go out uh, from the system, but again, flow in porous media is kind of a subset of what we'll talk about in this class. Fluid mechanics in recreation, uh, I don't, can't remember, was it the, well, you'd have been two. Was it the 2004 Olympic Games, which were in uh, Sydney, where they allowed for one Olympic Games, they allowed full body suits. And the idea of the full body suits is that it develops uh, little bubbles which make it much less give it much less drag. And so they used it for one year, I guess. Uh, also now they realize that Olympic swimming pools shouldn't just be six feet deep, they should be 10 feet or 15 feet deep because you, don't, you get less drag if, you're, if you seem like you're swimming in the ocean so you get faster times. But they used this, uh, Ian Thorpe was the big Australian star at the time, a precursor to Michael Phelps. And then I think the next year they used these suits but they used them just with short sleeves and, and, and short legs on them. America's Cup uh, used to be owned by America until the Australians uh, beat them, maybe in the late 90s, early 2000s. 
The design of their boat was a secret. They used to put it in the water with a, a sheet over the keel. And the secret of the keel was it had this hydroplane, just like an air, air wing, to lift you slightly up. And of course, I realize now that the America's Cup boats used to be single yachts. But now if you look at the America Cups, they're trimorans. And they also have these hydrofoils underneath them, so they actually lift out of the water. So the, the, um, uh, the hull is out of the water, just running on these um, uh, hydrofoils. And so they have much less drag, and so they can go much faster. So they go 50, 60 miles an hour, I think. I showed you the picture of the um, a cargo boat going from uh, China to Brazil to the BRICS conference in uh, Brasilia today. Surfing West Virginia, surfing waves, of course. Gravity going down the front of a wave. The, the water's coming forward past you and up the wave. Gravity going down and drag against you going up. And so there's an equilibrium between those. Just like a terminal velocity of someone falling out of the sky, gravity accelerating you downwards. You don't keep on accelerating because the drag that's applied on your body is a force that's acting against uh, F equals MA pulling you down. Why, does, why do you spin a football so, so it goes straight? And of course, uh, surfing uh, veil, I guess, is the same deal. Uh, resistance on the bottom of the board, and also air resistance on your body as you go down, and gravity being the acceleration that pulls you down. So it cuts everywhere, and of course, someone of you will in your presentation choose to use a golf ball, which is dimpled. Golf balls are dimpled because the dimpling makes it the, the airflow around it go turbulent much earlier, and turbulent flow, surprisingly, creates this little thin boundary layer, which is very efficient in making, in reducing uh, the drag. And so the dimpling allows it to go turbulent, and so the ball actually is able to go further because you can hit it, you hit it just as hard, but it accelerates faster because of less drag. And of course, why do you spin a baseball? Well, because uh, you can also look at the, the drag that occurs as you spin it, and that allows it to curve. And we can rationalize that. We will rationalize it in this class. So those are all the reasons that you should be excited uh, by this class. So let's get down to uh, the nitty-gritty of this. So today we'll uh, spend some time talking about uh, these things. Oh, I don't know why I did that. So we'll talk about what is a fluid. We'll talk about dimensional homogeneity. Uh, means that you add apples to apples, not apples to oranges. Uh, we'll talk about basic fluid properties of viscosity, density, uh, and uh, compressibility, and just generally talk about these individual things. So that's our plan for today. And so we'll get as far as we uh, get. So my proclivity is to, to write this down. So fluid properties. So don't know what we'll call this. I called it fluids in life, I guess, last time. I guess I don't need to touch it. So in terms of what is a fluid? A fluid can be a liquid or a gas. Not equal to a gas, but not a solid. And so we can look at those in terms of their properties. And so if I look at them individually, I'm not sure what uh, order I look at them in. I guess solid liquid and gas. So these are just uh, little differential cubes, if you like, of those materials. Solid, liquid, or gas. I guess uh, you know what the distinctions are. Liquid sits, will, will fill a container, but it always has a free surface to it. A solid, well, you know what a solid is. There's a board dust or whatever it is. Solid, you uh, compress and it deforms, but it would probably spring back. It doesn't go at a continuous velocity. And a gas goes to occupy the space that's available to it. It completely fills the career, uh, the container. So we will, in this class, we'll use the same standard uh, terminology as Munson uses. So you know what density is. is. Density is equal to a mass over a volume. And the units of it are rho, not p. And in this class, everything I do will be in uh, SI units. And so those are the SI units. 
And so if you look at density, then the density of a solid is typically high. The density of a liquid actually is usually almost as high. Solids. Rock is about 2,700 kilograms per cubic meter. Water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And uh, the density of a gas, as we'll find out, is about one kilogram per cubic meter in the, the, the air that we're sitting in right here. Viscosity. I guess that's an S, isn't it? Viscosity. The units of viscosity are, well, viscosity we'll call mu. Its units are pascal seconds. A pascal is uh, a newton per meter squared times seconds. And solids have uh, very high viscosities. Liquids have, I guess, moderate viscosities. And gases have relatively low viscosities. And we have modulus. And the units of that, I call it E. The units of that are pascals, which are, again, newtons per meter squared. And surprisingly, the modulus, the stiffness of something, the ability to w resist deformation. So if you have a cube of something, you apply some forces to it. If it doesn't deform, then it has a high modulus. And so that is what is a solid. And rocks have a modulus of 30 gigapascals, something like that. Surprisingly, liquids have bulk moduluses, which are pretty high as well, about 2 gigapascals. So this is high to, to less high. And gases are, have very low modulus. And the corollary of uh, the, the opposite of, of that is compressibility. Uh, which is we'll call beta, and your book calls beta, which is equal to 1 over modulus. It's just the reciprocal of modulus, so it's the opposite. And it's in units of meters squared per newton, just the reciprocal of this. And I guess um, by definition, uh, we can define modulus as equal to, uh, what is it? E is equal to the change in pressure divided by the change in volume over the initial volume. So if you imagine this being an initial volume, V0, if it changes in volume, well, I can't draw it so well, but if you imagine it changing in volume so that the stuff outside this dotted line is the change in volume, then if you change the volume in a closed container by squidging the container like you're putting your foot on the brake and a brake caliper works by having a, it act on a cylinder that has an incompressible fluid in it, then the incompressible fluid will have a high modulus. If you know what the volume change you apply to the original volume of the brake caliper, you can calculate what the pressure change would be that you'd cause, or a bicycle pump for that matter, same deal. And so, and so this is just the compressibility is just the reciprocal of this. And so if that's the reciprocal of this, then this one must be, a solid must have low compressibility. It doesn't compress very easily. And as would a liquid, and this is highly compressible. So air is a gas that's highly compressible. So that's this. We define some components. If we look at dimensionality, so the other thing that we can talk about, which is a basic uh, kind of uh, engineering skill for you to have. So if you're adding two things together, they have to have the same units in them. And so the easiest way for me to introduce that is to think about something like, I don't know, an area. How do you define a, an area? Straightforward, right? So I can do it straight lines. So y2 and y1. So if you want to figure out what the area is, then this area here. 
So by definition, an area is just equal to a double integral of x, y. And it's evaluated between the limits, x1, x2, y1, y2. And that if you integrate it, it's going to be x times y plus c, or it's also equal to x times y with the limits of x1, x2, y2, y1, all elementary stuff you've seen before, which is the same as being um, x2 minus x1, y2 minus y1. So a simple example, but it makes the case that th this is equal to the units of this must be length squared, right? Like, so if you, clearly you know the area is units of length squared. But if you look at this differential uh, or integral format, then also x and y occur this. You can also look at these, throw away this operator on them, and realize immediately from this equation that the units of area have to be in units of length squared. So that's useful, because then if you have an equation, for instance, that has units in it, that you add something to something and they're different units, you know the equation has to be wrong. Except for if you're a petroleum engineer, where it seems that all petroleum engineering equations have specific units that you have to use in it. And you have to use those specific units. We don't follow that mantra here. We work on the premise that uh, uh, we work on homogeneous equations where the units match as you go across, um, as you define them. If you look at, uh, let's do something a bit more challenging now. So you'll have probably seen Bernoulli in your past. And so if you think about uh, Bernoulli's equation, I was hoping that would be, then Bernoulli's equation, in this class, we'll write elevation to be z. And we'll always define elevation to be positive upwards. And we can also define, at a point, a pressure. And we could also define at that point some velocity. And almost certainly in your past, the only equation you need as a prerequisite to this class, that's why you need dynamics for this class, is Newton's second law. And you recognize that. This is just the change in velocity as a function of time. So you recognize that. And uh, you probably also realize that if I do this, I will write z plus p over rho g. We've defined pressure already in compressibility, density, gravity, elevation, positive upwards, plus v squared over 2g is equal constant. You might have seen that before. You might not. It doesn't really matter. But you realize from this, um, this is velocity and this is gravity. So really, actually, it's a balance between three quantities. It's called elevation head, pressure head, and velocity head. Uh, the reason it's called head is because, by definition, each of these in, is in units of length. If this is units of length, then these terms together must be in units of length, and these terms together must be in units of length as well. Otherwise, you, you're adding apples to apples. You're adding apples to oranges, I guess, rather than the other way around. And so what we can do with this is we can, as we'll use it, we'll define a couple of non-dimensional parameters. So by definition, if you wanted to, I guess, well, you could check. V squared over 2G. The units are equal to meters per second, all squared, divided by meters per second squared, which is meters squared per second squared over meters per second squared. And you're left, if you cancel out, just with this one meter sitting on top. So, so you can check the dimensions of this pretty straightforwardly. And so that doesn't tell you that this equation's right, 
But it does tell you that the equation has a chance of being right because it's the right dimensions. So the other thing we could do is we could divide these terms by each other. And so what we could do is we could take this and we could divide pressure over rho g and by 2g over v squared. So this is units of length. This is units of 1 over length. So by definition, this has to be in units of meters over meters. So if we define our units in terms of mass, length, and time, then each of these will be to the power 0 because it is unitless, because it's meters per meter. And so this will give us uh, what will cancel out. G will cancel out from this. We don't care about the 2 because we're just looking at the ratio. We have something which is pressure over rho v squared, which we'll use as a dimensionless number. It's called the Euler number, after the famous Swiss mathematician. And it's the ratio of pressure, force, divided by uh, velocity force. That's the ratio of two forces. Since they're forces, we could make them forces. They have, actually have the units of uh, length, but they, they, are, they represent forces. The other thing that we could also do is we could also define another one, which would be these two. And if we take those, then which one? So if we take um, 1 over z and multiply by v squared over 2g. Remember, this is elevation head. This is uh, velocity head. This is pressure head. Again, these must be length over length. So in terms of units, it would be v squared over zg. I don't care about the 2. And if we square root it, because we can do that as well, we end up with v over zg squared, which is known as the fruit number. DE number, which is the ratio of uh, velocity to elevation head, which is gravity. So it's the ratio of velocity to gravity forces. So actually, this is an important number when you're designing ships. You want an efficient ship. You don't want to have a big bow wave because you're putting energy into raising up that water and then it can dump down behind you as you go past it. So you want to minimize it. So you, you can define that behavior in terms of the food number. So in this class, we'll t talk about three important numbers. Euler number is one. This defines uh, the pressure that is on your chest as you're falling down through the air. So you're destroying a velocity. So it ter turns out the terminal velocity is something like 200 miles an hour. And the reason for that is, is the drag on your body is because the air that you're moving through I guess it's probably easier to think about riding a bicycle. You're going through the air, and the velocity of the wind's hitting you in the chest. That velocity of air creates a, a pressure on your chest, which is manifest as drag. And you can calculate that very simply uh, from using this equation. You know the velocity the air is traveling at. You know the density of the air is one kilogram per cubic meter. And so the pressure on your chest is merely calculated from that. And then from that, you can say something about uh, terminal velocity. The other one that we'll use, which is much more important than these, is called Reynolds number from Osborne Reynolds, which is the ratio of um, velocity forces to um, viscous forces. which I won't derive here, but it's equal to velocity, a length, some length. I, I guess I could use z, right? 
velocity, z, and density divided by viscosity. And so this is the equation that defines how much drag you have if you uh, have a pipe, for instance. So you should be able to push water through a pipe with no effort whatsoever if there's no resistance. But there is resistance. The resistance is due to frictional forces that act between the fluid and the side of the pipe. And this is conditioned, so this is a function of viscosity. And you can characterize this in terms of Reynolds number. And so the three numbers we have are Reynolds number, Froude number, and Euler number. So we don't need to know about those right now. But it's just e useful to define them. Um, what else? So this just represents two streamlines with flow between those two streamlines. Flow occurs at some velocity, is some location in elevation, and has some pressure attached to it. Usually when you use Bernoulli, you write it between two points where you have pressures at an upstream and a downstream location, and velocities at upstream and down lo downstream locations. And so you can write out this equation as two equal parts. You have six terms, and you want to solve for one of those six terms if you know the other five. We'll get to that soon enough. So I was making the point about dimensionality and about how that's quite an important thing for us. Um, you have to add apples to apples. And dimensional analysis, dimensionless analysis, is an important feature of um, fluid mechanics and engineering. So I, these are horrible notes, I'll admit to that. Uh, that's, that's why I don't use them very much, but they're there if you want them. I should also re reiterate that all these come from an earlier version of Munson. And even though I said that you don't need to buy the book, it's actually quite a useful thing to have. Because if I'm not making sense in class, you have a resource, uh, a resource to be able to, to go and see. So I'd, I still encourage you to get the book, whether you buy it or rent it or get a free seventh edition version, which I'm sure you can find online. But it's a good backup to have uh, to, to supplement the things we talk in this class when you don't understand something I'm doing. The other thing that we can do, and I kind of alluded to it when I talked about um, the fact that we can define dimensions. We can define the dimensions of something in terms of mass, length, and time. And if it's dimensionless, these will, have, we, these will be to the power zero. If it uh, has units of kilograms, it would be to the mass to the power one. But we can define these systems in terms of mass, length, and time, or force length and time. I always tend to use mass, length, and time. I guess there is one other parameter in this, and that is theta. And that's used in this book. And uh, theta is used for temperature. I'm not sure we have much cause to use uh, theta. But that is the, the fourth um, equation, if you, if you like. And so you can use this to be able to evaluate any kinds of uh, components that you, that you want. And so if you want to know, for instance, the units of force, you could show that where it's here. And of course, you might not want to memorize that, but you could get to that by writing out Newton's second law. And so by definition, this is mass. Well, let's, let's write, add in units. This is meters. It's not meters, is it? Kilograms times meters per second squared. So by definition, just for that, this is mass, length, each to the power one, and time to the power minus two. And so hopefully that's what you have here, mass, uh, moment of a force. Oh, force is here. Yeah, this is here. So this is force, mass, length, time. So for more complicated things, I guess, what did we say? We said that viscosity is equal to Pascal seconds, which is equal to Newtons per meter squared times seconds. Uh, how'd you get there? Well, you don't know this yet, but um, Newton's an important guy for us. Not only do we use Newton's second law, we also use Newton's law of viscosity. 
you might have seen it before, the shear stress. So in explaining what's going on, if you take a plate and you have a plate that sits above it, and to that plate you apply a shear force over an area so that you move that plate at some velocity. I guess I'm getting into this more. We'll talk about this on Friday. So this is a, a velocity. So this plate is moving at some velocity v. Then Newton's law of viscosity said that the shear stress that you develop is equal to viscosity multiplied by the change in velocity with location. Don't worry about this. So these are differentials, but the units of this have to be in units of velocity, and the units of this have to be in length. We forget the operator, the d operator in front of them. This is equal to a shear stress, which is equal to a shear force divided by an area. And so we could just retread this as equal to the viscosity is equal to shear stress dz dv. We can also write this as, if we wanted to, a force over an area times z times v. And um, I guess we're not doing so well because we've got a force. And I suppose we'd have to write that as mass times acceleration times z. It's getting a bit complicated all of a sudden, isn't it? <laughs> More complicated than I wanted. Area times a velocity. And so we could try working what that is. So this is kilograms meters per second squared meters meters squared, meters per second. So what is this? What's the definition of a Newton? The force required to give one kilogram an acceleration of one meter per second squared. So this term is one Newton, or this is Newtons. And what else is going to go here? This is, so it's going to be, it's just units. This is Newtons, and we've got uh, meters squared, meters squared, which cancel out. And we have um, over seconds. Um, I don't think meters per second squared, is that right? So in theory, it's in, uh, I guess I didn't want to do that because I, yeah, you know, so it's just as it is. Is that right? So mass, acceleration, meters per second squared, uh, length, meters squared, uh, meters per second. So the units should be, if I ignore this one here, it's going to be kilograms. Um, oh, I guess I used that twice, didn't I? So kilograms, meters squared, over seconds squared and meters cubed over seconds. And what happens to this? This is, this cancels leaving one meter. This cancels leaving, so it should be kilograms, seconds, meters. Is that right? Which is uh, mass length minus one time minus one. Is that right? Where's vis viscosity? Oh man, finally got there. <laughs> a bit torturous, but we finally got there. So the point is that you can do that for yourself. If there's a quantity you don't know, uh, you can always figure out how to get to it by being a bit creative. So all we did was we figured out that we, if we know what Newton's law of viscosity is and we don't know what viscosity the units are, if we know what the units of all the other properties are, 
by making this equal to, this stress is equal to a force divided by an area, so this is just equal to mass times acceleration, Newton's law. So be creative. So that's that. Oh, five minutes to go, so I'm not going as fast as I thought. So there's some other examples to do this. I don't think you need to go through this. The last thing I'll do is talk about um, uh, the scales that we use, and that's, we'll close out the class with that. And so we'll use uh, temperature scales and pressure scales. So if we look at pressure, if we look at absolute pressure versus gauge, then uh, an absolute vacuum is, um, so this is where we sit here. This is what we're at today. So this is one bar. So it's zero. So this, in terms of absolute pressure, this is one bar, which is equal to 101 kilopascals, which is the same as 10 to the 3 pascals, kilonewtons per meter squared. So that's atmospheric pressure and absolute pressure, but we call it zero. This is what we feel. This is zero pressure. So if you're looking at absolute zero, then this would be minus 101 kPa, and absolute pressure would be zero kPa. Um, If you look at temperature, uh, so you can also define these. Again, because we'll use the ideal gas law, you can use the same. Actually, I'll write it over a little further to the right, do exactly the same thing. So we can work in um, Kelvin or, yeah, we'll use Kelvin. So abs versus gauge, for a better word. Uh, then absolute temperature is zero Kelvin. Right now, where we're sitting here, freezing point is 273 Kelvin. What we're sitting at today is something like 293 Kelvin. And so this is zero degrees centigrade, 20 degrees centigrade minus 273 Kelvin. And the importance of using this is that if we look at the uh, ideal gas law, is the pressures and the temperatures we use have to be absolute important. Otherwise, you don't get the right results. So just remember that. No, you, you should have seen these scales before. And so next time we'll talk about uh, ideal gas law. Uh, and so that allows us to talk about taking the ideal gas law and compressing the gas. We know that if you take a volume of gas and compress it uh, by changing the volume, keeping the mass of gas but changing the volume, the pressure goes up. And so that's some manifestation of compressibility, which we talked about and defined this morning. And so we'll do that next time, talk about modulus and compressibility. And it seems a bit esoteric to talk about that, but it's a very important thing to talk about because the way that you're hearing me, you probably don't want to hear me anymore, is that my voice travels you to you at the speed of sound, and that speed of sound is dictated by the compressibility of the medium that we find ourselves in, which is air. And so. We talk about waves next time and compressibility uh, and viscosity. We'll round out this. Okay? No homework due. Enjoy this as your last thirsty, thirsty Thursday uh, before a midnight will, deliverable will be required for you. And we'll get together again on, uh, on Friday. So see you there. Thanks very much. <laughs>